All right, it's time for us to move in to our final panel for the day. And it's uh, quite an interesting one to kind of, you know, bring a close to all the conversations that we've having, been having throughout the day. So this one is building centers of excellence for smarter mobility in Africa to drive entrepreneurship and innovation to integrate the latest solutions into public transport. Uh, moderating this panel for us this, more, or this evening is Ofense. He's a lecturer for transport economics at the University of the Northwest. Ofense, are you there? Hey, how are you doing? Good in yourself. It's good to have you. You got a little bit of a disco vibe going on your shirt there this evening. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a reflector of the, the line. So it's an optical illusion. It's pretty cool. Not a problem. Tell us a little bit, Afense, exactly, uh, as lecturer of transport and economics at the University of the Northwest, what are you seeing as a lecturer and someone that is imparting knowledge onto the youth? Well, our responsibility, mobility? yes, our responsibility is quite difficult. And um, we, we're basically custodians of knowledge and we're responsible for communicating between the researchers who are doing the work full time, the practitioners who are involved with these problems on a daily basis. And we've got young minds that have an appetite and curiosity that we almost can't really satisfy given the digital age and the amount of information that they have. So our responsibility is to operate in the nexus and retaining a deep degree of interest to enable students to really go into areas that they're genuinely interested in and develop the kind of skills that are rare and valuable. And um, that will really set them up to be competitive candidates in the market. Shaping the minds of the future. That's exactly what you're doing, Offense. All right, so you are gonna be moderating this panel. Um, so let me leave you to it. Thank you. Hey, let's see, is Yandisa here? Hey. Okay. Good afternoon. Great. Good afternoon. How are you doing, Yandisa? I am very well, thank you. And how are you, Fancy? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, you know, welcome to this session, everyone. Um, this is all about building centers of excellence for smart mobility in Africa. Um, so it's myself, Ofente, and um, Yandisa, who is the founder and chief digital officer of Connecta here in South Africa. So I'll just uh, start off with some opening notes. And then uh, from there, we'll have an in-depth discussion with um, Yandisa specifically around Connecta and um, how we can translate their, their focus areas into potential points of reference for centers of excellence, at least as a point of um, departure. So in, in general, uh, centers of excellence represent this uh, complex nexus between connecting innovation, industry, policy, and capacity building. They are not only sector specific, but they are really multidisciplinary conduits necessary for development. They also translate innovation into practice. And um, not only do they coordinate research, but they also turn ideas into tangible outputs that would actually result in measurable result, measurable output outcomes. <laughs> and um, the, the whole idea here is not only to engage on the intellectual property landscape, but also to stretch it a lot further into to the African environment, particularly with, with respect to innovation, 4IR, technology, electrification, and the debates around it. So governments really wish to connect um, with and respond to these trends as they ripple through all sectors, influencing best practice, challenging norms, and absorbing as much labor as they could alienate. And um, so I'm really excited to, to have a session with you. This is a one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe you could introduce yourself, um, give us some opening notes, and then um, we'll, we'll go into a few deep discussions from there on. OK, thank you so much for having me. And greetings to everyone who's joined us. Um, yeah, we have the hardest task uh, to close off. I'm hoping everyone is still energized and I see it's just the two of us now. So I'll try to speak for everyone who's not here. Um, just for background and introduction, my name is Yan Bisa. So Kanyila, I'm the founder of um, Connecta, P2Y LTD. We are based in South Africa in Johannesburg and our business is more focused on building wireless networks and platforms to gather big data and enable value um, added services. So we believe that before we go into any 4IR talk, digital transformation, connectivity is the key 
So hence, we provide free Wi-Fi. We build Wi-Fi networks at public areas, especially public transport areas, which is where we believe that a lot of our people flock out. Um, we know the issues that we still have currently. Um, we find a number of people spending a lot of time in the taxi ranks, which is between 30 minutes to an hour. It could even be two hours on some days. So that is time that they could put into good use. So with us providing that connectivity, we're able to enable a number of other services that can ride on top before we start talking, um, you know, um, payments or um, e-commerce, um, any other thing um, that gives them an opportunity. So they need to first get uh, used to being connected and being online. So once they spend that time, then they can be able to do other things, download those apps and, you know, drive advertising, do um, data analysis, um, use that as also as a platform for the taxi associations and government for, for notifications. And it's even good for, for, for COVID tracing, you know, as we're able to track the people that were at the taxi rank at a certain a specific time. And also what we do, our companies focus mainly in the transport sector. Uh, we believe that is the driver of the of the economy. You know, you can't run away, especially with public transport, because we're in a country where you have over 60 people, 60 percent of the population using public transport. So innovation in this sector is very critical. So once we start with the connectivity, this is where we say now any other product can thrive. We can start talking cashless payments because people are used to being online, to be connected online. Mm. And, you know, you're raising some really interesting points um, that, that I think we should almost break down a little bit because the discussions so far today have been really, really um, intense in terms of, you know, mobilizing the transportation um, network, particularly um, digitizing public transport. And, you know, one of the startup pitches, you know, I, I'll okay. actually... Um, highlight two of them that I found really interesting. Um, the one was from from um, um, Walla, and uh, it was really interesting to see them talking about the long distance transport market. And then the the other one was was on um, how digitizing uh, minibus taxi routes would or pirate transit routes, in other words, was mm -hmm. really, really valuable. So um, as connector, what is really what is your value proposition in this regard? Because I found your two main points um, very interesting. The one was that there are people who are using taxi ranks, spending time at taxi ranks. Um, and then on the other hand, we also have, you know, there's a, there's a business or financial model that could be there, um, yeah. that could be tapped into. So could you just take us through that a little bit um, for, for us newbies here? Okay. I think that we've had really great conversations. Um, I managed to also just um, um, listen to some of the other speakers. Um, one of the guys, Alex, I think from Kenya, was putting their scenario to say that if you can um, digitize the payment solutions, it will solve a number of problems. So when we talk about the, the public transport, especially the taxi industry, it is the biggest transporter of, um, in, the, in the public um, transport sector. So once we start there, there's a number of issues that needs to be looked at also. The, the issue of digitizing the routes is well and good. You know, it, it, it can solve a number of problems. We know that mostly the many times where there's challenges in the taxi industry, it's always been fighting about the routes, you know, and, and anything like that. So once you start digitizing the routes, that could actually help. Um, the, the, the the, the, the cash collection system that they're currently using right now, it is in a way just enabling the behavior of the drivers right now because you get a driver that has to bring in a thousand rands or whatever amount to the owner on the day and the rest of what they collect in the remainder of the day is theirs. So in their minds already, they are working. So literally when you say time is money, for taxi drivers, time is money. And that is a system that has been there and they are just working according to that system. And this is what actually makes them to drive the, the way that they do because they're chasing, they're chasing cash. And we cannot blame them because for them, that's actually how they generate their own revenue. So when you start introducing um, cashless payments, you know, that is taking away that. But you can't just bring it in. You know, you have to supplement, you know, 
compensate that and have a structure that will actually make sure that the taxi drivers also buy in because for the rest of their lives or their careers, this is the system that they've been used to. So change management is very important. And when we're doing the digital transformation, it's not just about the solutions or about the applications or the technology that comes. It's 80% the people. Once you can have a solution, but if there's no take in or buy in from the people that's supposed to use all the stakeholders, it's gonna be pointless. So we have to start teaching people getting them and, and walking the journey with them slowly, especially in that sector, because that has been that way. If you look at the, the transformation that happens, there, there's nothing change um, in the roots. If you used to take a taxi 10 years ago, you still go back and you find the taxi um, going to the place, still in the very same place. So you see that there hasn't been much of transformation. The system is still the same. Sliding door operator opens, you come in, you pay the money, uh, you know, that's a system. If you're in the front, you're in the accountant or the bookkeeper for the day, you know, so the system hasn't changed. So now we need to start thinking, how do we change the mindset of the people? So this is what the role that we play um, besides just providing connectivity. Our business is to do the research, the digital transformation, design thinking, the whole innovation ecosystem. So where we understand who the target market is, how do we connect? That's why we connect. How do we make sure we connect to the people? You know, there's a lot of things. There's culture, there's mindset, there's, there's emotional intelligence. There's all of these other aspects that we need to factor in before we introduce technology. With us starting with internet, you know, you get people getting used to being online. And you start seeing the taxi driver sitting there being online. They're not just going to go online and, and do nothing. They start engaging. You know, once you start sending them a link and they know how to open a link, start registering through a portal, then they start registering for other things. Then they get used to that whole system. Then you can start bringing all the other things, but you can't just be a drop and say technology is here. Let's transform the routes are going to work with this. Stakeholder in engagement is very critical. And what we have done, in rolling out the Wi-Fi networks, we have actually started with the Department of Transport, the Gauteng Department of Transport as a stakeholder, brought them in so that they can understand the bigger picture, the vision of what we're trying to achieve and how that will enable them to do their own rollouts or even um, you know, use it for their benefit as well. And then they brought in the taxi associations as a stakeholder. So we've had multiple engagement with the taxi associations. And trust me, it's nothing like what is being said about the taxi industry. You sit with um, the guys from Amsta and Atta who come to a meeting, who have a vision, who want to empower their taxi um, drivers. And it's through those engagements where you actually learn the, the real challenges. You know, it's through the engagement with the taxi associations, with the taxi owners, with the, with the taxi drivers also, where you get the different um, fields and the different, um, you know, be able to establish the, the, the different problems within the sector. That is when we start creating now a solution that could actually um, work for them. But digitizing routes, digitizing payments, uh, it is critical. Ride sharing, um, you know, um, that will be very good. Um, mobile apps or, you know, journey planners, that is something that will work. But when we're doing the development, we need to start and think, how does the whole ecosystem benefit? Because there's an association, there's a taxi owner, there's a driver, there's a commuter. So all of those four stakeholders are very critical to any innovation design that you do. So whatever that you do, so it must talk to these four and address the problems for these four. Because if there's one aspect or leg that is left out, this is where you start seeing challenges, where there's a number of innovations and number of apps that are being launched on a daily basis and they never make it um, to the market. They'll make it to the market, but you don't know what really happens because there is a gap somewhere. Yeah, let's go into um, uh, something that, that you're sort of um, highlighting as well, largely because when we think about a lot of the discussions that have been held today, um, many of the sessions, for example, include um, women inclusion in the you know business models um, across the board. Um, but it's not just about you know what we have as you know paratransit here in Africa. It's also about mm -hmm. formal, traditional, scheduled public transport services as well. And, and you know, there's there's a wording that you that you're using, and that I find really interesting, specifically for the center of excellence, um, is around the the innovation um, ecosystem. 
So I'm quite curious about that, um, about you know how that will work, and uh, what that what that implies. Is Yandisa still on? When we think about what what the ecosystem is really about, for me, it just l listening to Yandisa highlights that there's so many different factors and variables involved, and it requires a different type of uh, focus and. If you think about it, um, are there programs on change management in the transport sector, human capacity development in the transportation sector, labor reforms? Um, and, and these are primary inputs in actually getting the technology to be applied. Now, when you look at or when you listen to, to Yanis's point, specifically with reference to electric vehicles and the transition thereof, you know, the conversation gets even more complex. And the big question is, especially from, um, from Yandisa's uh, presentation, the big question really is, you know, what are the implications for this, especially for curriculum development here in Africa? You know, what kind of courses should we be um, facilitating and developing? What kind of research should we, be, should we be focusing on? And for me, that is really one of the main take homes from, from, from Yandisa's uh, presentation. Afense, with you guys personally at the University of the Northwest, what do you see coming through in the future in terms of curriculum? Is there something specifically that stands out for you that you want to touch on? Well, you know, I, I can speak from a research perspective in terms of the kind of work that has been um, emerging specifically here in Africa. You know, much of the work that dominates the conversation at a continental level has been you know, leaning towards traditional engineering work. But we're now finding that there's a lot more research being done in what we call paratransit. So this is whether it's the tuk-tuks, um, motorbike taxis, minibus taxis, bora boras, hybrid buses, there's a lot more work that's being done there. And we only have so few books. I think there are two primary books on this uh, particular topic. And in terms of integrating them into the curriculum across the board, it's going to be really essential. But then again, the, the degree to which these materials are technical is also another factor. You know, like, it, can you read the material or do the course and actually do something in your local community? And that is absolutely key, especially for developing the right kind of curriculum for, for learners. And again, for, from a smarter mobility perspective, we also have to have a real focus on understanding what it means to be in, a, in, a, in an African city or an African town. It means walking, it means cycling, it means sun, it means a lack of sidewalk, <laughs> it means difficult internet. You know, like it means a lot of different things. And, and we have to basically navigate research, navigate projects, navigate initiatives through that, you know, through that funnel. And that's really, really crucial. Indisa, I see you nodding in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Um, oh, yes. Thank you. Um, maybe Sorry we about that. If, um, if there's any questions that you guys would like to ask the panel, please also add those to the comments section and uh, we'll get Offense and Yandisa to answer them in a few minutes. But I don't want to interrupt your guys' conversation because we lost Yandisa there for a moment. Please do uh, continue. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Yandisa, you know, the, the is something that you were highlighting that that I think would just sort of I'll summarize it real quick. Um, yeah. You know, if we if, if we have to build a center of excellence, just in a in a hypothetical African city, we, we can pick Accra, for example, or, or we could in fact pick Kisumu. You know, um, and we have to build a center of excellence. How how would you set that up in a way that is attached to this innovation ecosystem that you're talking about? What would be let's say the top five main things that we'd have to focus on? Okay, personally, I just believe we need more centers of excellence, you know, um, for each African city, if we if, if have to, you know. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the challenges and where we are as, as a continent in terms of um, 4IR adoption, in terms of innovation, um, you know, digital transformation, we do need, especially in the, in the, in the mobility sector, there is a lot that is coming up, and I think the role the centers could actually play is is very critical. And it's not just now having maybe one 
um, I will be biased and say, um, you know, we need one and we can both in South Africa. So, and to take it to a, a smaller city, not just in the big cities, because I do believe that the greatest innovation and invention will come from rural communities or marginalized communities. You know, the brilliance that comes from there, the, the creativity, when you speak to these children in these areas, and I remember we used to build uh, cars with, um, with wire and all of this because they didn't have toys. So they make the most with what they have. So imagine when you can have access to, to, to that research, to that IP that is being developed in those areas. And um, I and honestly believe that to run an, um, a center of excellence, it can't just stand, be a standalone or maybe just being attached to an institution only. There has to be a whole ecosystem built. One, we need to have corporates involved. We need to have, um, you know, incubation hubs or incubation centers, these innovation centers, so that when that research, because the, the problem that small businesses have is actually doing the research part, you know, and if the centers can actually be able to provide that and also form part of a guidance and then work with incubation centers that can take these bright minds, these ideas, and be able to give them access to the IPs that have been developed or to research that has been done so that we don't find um, innovators or SMMEs or startups all doing the same um, innovation or doing something that somebody has already done a research on and can actually give you a blueprint to say, this is the work that we have done. This is a paper that we have accomplished. This is the IP that we have. So that you're able to take that. And taking that, you're part of an incubation system because most of the startups and also the innovators, all they need is the support, um, access to all those resources. Once you have the support and access to the resources, then there must be a role that corporate plays where they are able now to incubate or take over or do some support into that. And also it could just be a system all around where corporates can actually fund the, 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 the centers of excellence because whatever innovation that comes out of that, corporate still benefits in either way, you know, in a transport sector, they still have to finance whatever that innovation that is going to come out if it's an if it's a um an, an let's say a, a e-hailing or whatever uh platform there will still be cars that are used or there'll be scooters or bikes that are used there is a manufacturer of those bikes you know what role are they playing in this ecosystem you know so we just have to and not just leave the centers of excellence where great work is being done it's being published and it ends in the publication it needs to form the whole ecosystem where we have a structure where the smmes the startups can be brought in where there's a startup open day to say here's an ip that is available here's research in the sectors that have been done so that they are able to align their inventions towards what has been researched already you know so that would also probably just propel us moving into, into um, the, the, the digital transformation and also assist a lot of um, um, SMMEs and startups because the cost of doing that, that research and most of them just go and do a development without even testing and going through the, the, the processes also because the idea is so good, the desire is there, the hunger is there, they want to see the project on the app store or somebody taking that off, you know. So some mm -hmm. make it and it's well and good when you see this uh, people making it and they, there's traction in their business, you know. But there are those that will tell you, I have lost so much money. You know, I've invested my money and it, 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 it's heartbreaking to see because you know the passion of an entrepreneur. You want things to happen because you know it's going to solve a problem. You might actually be, you know, knowing the problem, but you're coming with a, a wrong solution for the problem. You know, so if the centers can actually work on an ecosystem, so where all the stakeholders come together and we know. And I think corporate needs to play a critical role in the space because at the end of the day, they become the, the clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, um, just on your on your main points, I think it, it is. We also have to be really like honest about it because you know mm -hmm. the the transport sector is across an entire value chain. You've got right from industry. Um, so you see this, for example, with um, EULO's partnership with the um, University of KZN. So the, mm -hmm. basically, right from you know the point of you know production all the way up to you know putting it up to market. And this is really, really challenging. But even in the transport sector, we must acknowledge that 
you know, there are other sectors that are attached to us. For example, um, whether it's retail, um, whether it is real estate, or whether it is just telecoms. And public transport in, in many ways can serve as, you know, as a facilitator of all of these interfaces. And I'm quite curious about your thoughts around, you know, how to take um, an idea like a center of excellence, you know, and, and put it into, into, a, into the market for, not just for the purpose of publication and research, not just for the purpose of investment from the private sector, but building an appetite for it specifically from the public sector. Is it, is it the responsibility of academics or is it the responsibility of you know, the state to basically argue that, hey, this is a priority, let's focus on this and set these centers of excellence up? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. For me, I think my thought process is, is it's always like in the in the same space. One, whether it's anything that has to do with development um, of people, empowering of people, I always say it's not something that needs to be left to to one party, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether it's academia. It's it's a collective because we need to also look at the role that government plays. You know, there are sectors. We also sector specific to say. Whose mandate is it to focus on this? But you know, if things are not being done because somebody also thinks, no, it, it's not me. My 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 main purpose, or you know, is to focus on a, on on development or any other thing. You know, um, academia will think, okay, this is more our thing. We're already there, so it, let's take it and own it. Once you own it, the other stakeholders pull back and say, no, it's an academia issue. Um, they need to look at that, and then you'll find that. Uh, government saying, no, 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 we provide the infrastructure, we make sure the environment is conducive, corporate says, oh, we service client, or we've got a CSI fund, or, or whatever. It has to be a multi-stakeholder approach when you're dealing with empowerment of people. There has to be, everybody needs to chip in and play and, and actually play their part. Even the, the, the SMME, the startups, needs to have access to, to that, you know. It mustn't be seen that it's something that is really, you know, people have no access to, they cannot reach because it's more now academia, it's in a university. For a young girl in a, some rural area with a desire, then for them, that is already blocked out because they don't know there's even, um, you know, a center of excellence that can actually provide the support or with this information. So the buy-in needs to be from, from all sides. But academia, that's a role that, um, that's actually what you guys are doing. It's, it's a critical role. So it is now bringing all the other stakeholders so that you drive it together. You know, you, it, it can't just be um, just one, um, let's say, party playing or, you know, but academia is driving the role um, right now, of which is very good because that's exactly what you guys are doing. So it is the collaborations that now needs to be formed. How do you bring in the Department of uh, Digital Technologies? Which department talk to us? How do we bring in the Department of Transport so that we form those partnerships? And how do we bring in the incubators that are dealing with the SMMEs that we're looking for so that they become part of the conversations? And how do we even enhance the offering of the um, centers of excellence. How do we grow that so that it is also sustainable and we can see um, tangible results and traction out of it? And also just communicating the results from there so that once people know exactly what has come out, you know, people always think it's a paper that is being published, but what are the tangible results? So that's as much as we publish, that needs to be published as well, because that boosts the confidence within the communities to know exactly, you know, um, a company like this partnered with us, as you say, you know, with the UKZN or a partnership of that nature, this is what it has um, benefited, you know, so that you find all these other SMMEs looking forward to being part of that journey. Because also perception is something else, you know, so it, it can impact a lot of things. But personally, I do think anything that has to do with development of people, it is a multi-stakeholder um, engagement. And once that works, if we have that system, I, I think things can actually move um, a lot quicker and faster and be more impactful. Mm -hmm. And just one more, one more, um, a little bit on the more intense side. You know, there, there's a lot of talk about this energy transition. Um, and, and, you know, that is possibly one of the, you know, the big um, conversations in this. Um, I think it's even in tomorrow's sessions. Um, and, and the real challenge is, you know, making sense of this um, from, from an African perspective. Um, 
you know, it's not just the, the, the technology that will be necessary, but it is really about where the technology will come from. Where will it be produced from? Who will own it, et cetera, right? And I'm curious at this point, you know, based on you know, your, your argument that it's a collaborative exercise, you know, I'm quite curious about what you think would make um, the role of the center of excellence uh, uh, one that adds value to the just transition. So a transition that is equitable um, from, let's say, high carbon to low carbon transport or from very you know, paper intense transport systems to, to you know, octopus type mm. you know, uh, digital identities. What do you think would make the transition and, 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 and the role of the center of excellence in that regard? Okay, um, it, is, it is definitely something that we, we're not gonna run away from. Um, you see the green economy is actually up on, on the rise and it's the right thing um, to do. It's a right transition to be making. And I think the, the, the role that the centers of excellence can actually uh, play there. Firstly, it is more of um, making even the awareness, you know, of the impact, you know, once we do, more of those impact studies on, um, you know, what the role um, green economy can play, what is the value of it, you, you know. So we start with that because we need to start making sure that people do understand the need for us to transition. As I say, sometimes just dropping things and without that knowledge or education around it, it, it sort of sort of delays um, a bit. So I think this is where the centers of excellence can actually be quite critical and um, can push because there is an opportunity um, right there. We have seen kids in, 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 in rural areas also, you know, just creating devices to, to generate their own um, energy, to just charge their phones, you know, taking the scraps and pieces of whatever that they have there, you know, but because they don't understand the value of green equipment, them is just putting things together. And you mm -hmm. talk about the issue of manufacturing. That is another conversation that we need to be having as Africa. And it's very critical that we end up being uh, the consumers or the importers of everything. If we can have the centers now also looking at how do we start manufacturing all of this, um, you know, the, the technology that is needed, the equipment that is needed, but also just making sure that even, okay, corporate is already going into that um, where they, they know the value of, of, of having the green economy and the impact of that. So I was, I was saying that it's good that COVID is just a, a virus. Imagine if it was it had something to do with, with global warming and you can't mm. go out because the sun now is, is, is over 50 degrees or anything is happening like that, things like that that we don't have control of. You know? mm. But once you start painting the picture to understand this is the reason why we are converting you know, the carbon emission and this is what we are trying to reduce. But the, the issue of manufacturing, it's a, it's a conversation that we really need to have and how do we, um, how does the centers of excellence now empower um, you know, local um, people to actually get into manufacturing of these, um, you know, renewable energies or all these, um, you know, green energy solutions that can come and actually support, you know. So if that could be a call out, because I think that's also a, a market that is still very open that we can actually get to besides having load shedding, you know, and any other energy problems, but that's just a conversation that we need. So if the mobility sector is actually picking up, you know, that could also generate a lot of people. Imagine if we have the electric scooters and, you know, in South Africa, we don't have a lot of those, but if there could be, um, you know, there is a need when you see now what COVID has done and um, the growth in the, in the e-commerce sector. So that's a conversation that the, I mean, the role that the, the centers of excellence can actually play and just push forward with manufacturing and the support that you guys can give, um, it will go a really long way. And, you know, I'm just um, trying to, to wrap my head around it. It's, um, you know, there are so many examples that we can, um, that we can work with. Um, especially at a global level. Um, so, but many, most of the time, you find that you know there's there's a much stronger focus on the climate change um, issue. Yeah. But 
here in Africa, we, we you know, we, you said it earlier on that, you know, as much as you want to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, there is still, you know, um, other issues that we have to deal with and we can't just make a quantum leap. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, um, it, it leaves people behind. So that where our transitions are very, very different from from transitions elsewhere. But then it, it, it leads us to to this type of question around like, if you, when you think about it, um, most places where there's a big talk about um, uh, reducing carbon emissions and so on, you've got a lot of private car usage. Um, mm. Here, you know, we've got a lot of people who are still walking and using public transport. And that might be, you know, a, a, the point of, you know, of, of having a significant focus, you know, on public transport, you know, yeah. um, rather than, r rather than, um, rather than, you know, falling for, for the traps around the same sequence of, of, of interventions that, mm -hmm. that we see uh, internationally. So oh, yeah. maybe if we, if we take the scope up just, uh, just, a, just a little bit again, back to, uh, back to Connecta. Um, you you have um, work that touches on you know land use um, or real estate. You've got work that touches on again re retail. You also have work that touches on um, other sectors. And you know I just wanted to to find out from you if if when when you think or you look back or look ahead actually um, is there are there any you know points of contact you know between you know those other sectors. And the transportation sectors, particularly from a you know a digital, but also as you put it, from a change management perspective, is there are there points of connection, or are we missing them? You know, what are your thoughts around that? Does I also think um, transport, as we said earlier, it it cuts right across. It's it, it impacts every every single sector as much as digitization and um, technology just cuts right across. So if you look at um, transport, so let's take one in terms of um, mapping. So you still need uh, a transport, uh, let's say an ambulance. It's an ambulance that takes a person to a hospital. That's still part of transport, but it links up to health. Um, you have retail that has got logistics, which is the transportation of, of, of products to the, the retail stores, you know, so you have transport cutting right across. So it is very important to have this conversation in terms of digitizing that. So you see with the e-commerce now, it's still transport that is the biggest stakeholder in this whole uh, platform besides the, the payment gateways and the products. So it is the transport that is actually transporting all of those um, all of those goods. But what is really important is how do we use probably the data that is available from the transport sector to actually enhance or assist even government in terms of, of planning, you know. So that data, when we talked about the routes, digitizing of those routes, you know, that that is just critical information, that, I mean, crucial information that can help even the different sectors to make decisions. If you look at the routes, let's say, you know, within the certain taxi rank, the number of people that are passing through that, then influences retail because now they know there's a certain number of people who travel to this area. That means we need to put a shopping center in this area so that we can cater for those people, not for them to take transport to move to different areas. So that is retail. So you can even look at the case of also the, the how train, how the property um, around the how train stations have just boomed because people want to be closer to work. That what transport does. Once we are able to now start connecting those dots, because whenever there's a development of a, a transport hub, whether it's a new train, it's a station, or it's a taxi rank or anything, that now suddenly enables other industries to, to, to come in. But that information comes from the transport sector. It's a number of people. So you've got your retail that is being impacted. Obviously, property groups you cannot leave because they want, you know, so if you develop a route planner, you want a route planner um, that will give a customer access to get to your shopping center. If this person is not driving, they're going to use public transport. How do I leave from my house taking public transport to a certain shopping center, you know? And the reason why people don't use public transport is because it's the accessibility, one of the things, and also they just don't know where to get it, you know? And how, how long is that route? And where am I gonna um, get the, 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 the transport or the taxi? 
So you're sort of like, ah, let me just leave it. I just want to go back to what is standard and what I know and it will get me there. Um, one of the projects we've worked on was uh, how to win the move an app for the De uh, Department of Transport, which is a route planner for the province um, that combines taxi, um, train and bus into one app and gives you all the stops, the routes and the time, the cost of you planning a journey so that it becomes easy. So with a solution like that, you're able to integrate all the others. You can integrate the hospitals now, put in the police stations and the shopping centers and the places of interest in the same application. So that when you are traveling in a taxi, you are able to connect and know there's a shopping center here, or there's a museum or any other, um, um, you know, or a healthcare facility in the, in the, in the area. So transport really plays a, a crucial role. So digitizing the transport sector and actually enabling that data to be available can actually impact and grow the other sectors as well. You know, um, one of the things, so this is a, a bit of a, a bit of a shock because um, now, the, now the question is, you know, whether whether a center of excellence is then a building or it is a community, you know, yeah. <laughs> because, because, because that's, because yeah. if you think about it, like the, the scale of, you know, these interactions, you know, it's with people, it's technology, it's skills, it's um, SMMEs, it's women, it's, you know, young people in, you know, in, in rural areas in urban areas. And I, you know, now the question is, you know, is it, is it is a center of excellence a building or is it a community and and if if we were going to sort of draw the line you know let's say we have to draw the line you know where would we really draw the line you know so <laughs> yeah that's a very interesting uh, uh thought i actually think it would be a, it could be a building with the community in it or a platform for the economy i mean for the for the community to be in it because think about it you know the, the the people who know the problem are in the community. So the the, the best researchers, the best uh, you know candidates, we will find them also in that community because they know they know their problems, they know their solutions, they know what they want, they know what they need. They can even give you much more advice than what you thought from from a different angle that this is what is um, is needed and and necessary. So. The thought will be, how do we bring the community into these structured centers of excellence and, you know, making them part of it so that when that um, research is being done or, you know, a call for ideas, for solutions, the community also feels a part of, of the center. And that's why I said in the beginning, I would love for the centers to be found in just smaller even communities because for that you are more likely even if it's a, it's a smaller hub or a, a digital hub or some hub in a smaller community that can address the needs of these communities because if you look at our country also just south africa it's we are very it's a very rural country there's a lot of people and still in the rural areas who always feel like they are left out actually they were always are marginalized and left out of these um, um conversations so having maybe um some hubs in these communities can actually help so and have a way of bringing that community in into that um center of excellence and you know it's it, just to go full circle um we started off you know talking about public transport and specifically the taxi industry and you know how the technology is not just about the technology but it's about the people and, and 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 at this point you know if a center of excellence is anything you know it's you know yes it's a building as you put it or a structure but it's also um, it also involves a community and at this point you know if if, if we're going to have a rounded you know conversation about how to apply this in the public transport context you know what would that mean you know it, because you know for us research wise we we talk about things like asset based communities where mm -hmm. your, your community is viewed as an asset you know not just you know a stakeholder to engage with you yeah. know they're an actually mm -hmm. an asset that mm -hmm. produces a return on investment you know mm -hmm. um, 
so on. So, so if if we're gonna you know wrap the conversation up, you know, what would be your your main points of 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 advice, especially for public transport, um, and setting up you know good quality centers of excellence in this regard? Okay, that that's really great. Um, I would say you will ignore public transport at your own peril. It is the biggest sector, it's the biggest driver of people. So once you have that much power, there has to be a lot of development that happens there. One, the ecosystem. So if a center of excellence in the transport sector, public transport specifically, needs to be set up, it, it actually it's something that needs to be done. You know, um, I remember there was gonna be a driving school in the yeah, it was a center of excellence that was announced for the taxi drivers and, and all of that. So it is very important to have it. We have people that are taking care of over 62% of the community on a daily basis. So surely that is something on its own. So we need to set it up and actually make sure that all the stakeholders um, or the assets as you call them, are engaged and can benefit <laughs> to this <laughs> to the center you know you cannot leave anyone behind you cannot design anything without finding out what the commuters problems are and their needs and surely do not leave the taxi driver out because the taxi we don't have issues with the roads i say our roads are, are fine almost as good we need to give government credit for that our roads are good our cars are good the problem is the driving you know so you cannot leave the, the, the problem out and not bring them into that um, conversation. Also, you've got the owners who've got their different needs. You've got the associations who have a different mandate, you know. So we need to bring in all the stakeholders in the public transport, um, you know, and have that center of excellence. For me, it will focus focus on, on just emotional intelligence because you're working with people, you are driving people's lives on a daily basis. So that is an impact that, um, that the taxi drivers um, actually have. And one of the projects that we're currently working on um, at Connect is called Drivers, where it is a reward system for rewarding good driving for drivers. My father was a taxi driver, so that industry I know very well, I know what enabled him having to sit in the taxi rank and talk to the owners, you get to know exactly what is happening within the industry. So those are things that needs to take to, into, into consideration. So that center of excellence is actually long overdue because if we have uh, drivers taking our people to work, and once you start showing them the driver behavior and say, my guy, this is how you are driving right now. Do you know what that means? If you cause an accident, you know, you kill people, that's jail time for you. When, when you bring it home, you know, you go to prison, your kids will be left alone. You won't even bring in that money because you were chasing an extra 10 rents. Once you start people like people and understanding what drives them, then you are able to create solutions. So even when we're developing the solutions or innovation, we need to be able to understand the people, the culture, the mindset, all of this, the history, our, 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 our belief system. It's very important so that you can put all of that together. But emotional intelligence, um, spiritual intelligence, especially when you're working with people, it's, it's critical. Customer service, you know, you're not just caring, you're not just picking up money, you are taking people, you are enabling people to get to, to, to actually work. And the role that the taxi industry plays is quite critical. And, you know, so it is just how do we bring everyone to understand the, the power and the role that they play so that they can play it effectively as well. So the driver literally is a steering in this whole system because they're the ones that are taking people. How do we enable this guy to feel good about himself? And don't call him umageza, you know, and, you know, with some, how do you make this guy? And how do we as commuters understand the role that this guy plays? You see, when they go on strike, when they close the road, then you start understanding that, yeah, the taxi industry. But how do we empower the individual person to actually start appreciating the work they do and seeing value in what, in, in what um, they do? You know, you have the taxi owners who owns this. Some of them are really passionate about transport and they want to empower these drivers. And how do we start the driver and empower the driver to be a taxi owner, get into business as well. How do we train them in, in, in customer care? Because they never got training. They just take somebody to go and, and drive. 
you know, that person wants to make money. They've got their own problems. But, you know, that's a training that need, um, they need to, to, to be receiving. So it's, it's really a critical role that the public transport uh, plays. And also, I like uh, the, the partnerships that are being done by the tax associations with the likes of um, the, the how train where they bring them in. So developments like that can actually happen. So where even the taxi owners can be put into the mainstream um, and, and into the other modes and, you know, you know, just add on to that so that we can have more people maybe getting into trains. So when you decide now we're going into rail, let's also bring in the taxi associations to say we are taking from you because more people are going to rail but this is the role that you can play and this is how we can integrate you you know so that they feel part of of the of the whole ecosystem as well that's amazing yandisa um driving minds through emotional intelligence the african centers of excellence it's a wonderful session i really appreciate your time and thank you for thank everyone you for so tuning in at the end of the day, you know, we know this is the last stretch. Um, ben and uh, team, uh, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, it's over to you guys. Thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you to the team.